Perfect Tides is far from a perfect game, but it's also one I haven't been able to stop thinking about since I first came across it a few months ago, and I, I struggled for a while about what I wanted to say about it in a video, how I could articulate my feelings on it really clearly, and I have yet to come to a satisfactory answer to that question, but as it turns out, there's a Kickstarter campaign for a sequel that hasn't hit its funding goal yet, and there's less than a week left. I would very much like to see a sequel to this game, so it's time for me to put together a slightly slapdash and messy video about this extremely interesting but messy video game, so I can, I don't know, maybe, maybe generate a little bit more interest in the game. Perfect Tides is a point-and-click adventure game in the style of classic Sierra and LucasArts titles, and it sure does inherit some design issues from those games that I'll loop back to in a minute, but uh, trust me, you're here for the story anyway. There's not exactly a complicated epic narrative to break down here, it's a very intimate, very blunt story about being a teenager and feeling like your life is never going to start. What makes it stand out is the quality of the character writing and the vividness with which it remembers how teenagers think and behave. Perfect Tides is full of great characters, but the central character is Mara, a lonely and self-destructive 15-year-old girl depicted with a very intimate, knowing honesty. Like a lot of teenagers, she doesn't have a particularly good reason to be as depressed and moody as she is, and she's convinced that no one else has it as bad as she does. From the audience, it's easy to see how misplaced most of her worries are, how silly her certainty is that everyone is out to get her, and her inability to see past her own nose, but the game takes her insecurities just seriously enough to show why she thinks the way that she does, to get inside of her head, and it's the quality of the character writing, the thoroughness with which Mara is brought to life that draws me into this game. It'd be relatively easy to write dialogue for a character, point at them, and go, look at this idiot. It's a good bit harder to write that dialogue, point, go look at this idiot, and then also go deep inside her head and put her thoughts on display in a way that makes sense and feels real. That's a big part of why this game has stuck with me so much. Mara is pathetic, and the game wants us to see her as such, but it's a balancing act where you do understand her, and she is being taken seriously, at least as a real human being, but she's also very, very funny. And she has no idea. I spent so much of this game laughing at her expense, and in a way, the game's cartoony style actually undercuts Mara's unreliable, overly dramatic narration. She takes herself completely seriously. The narration treats things with dire concern constantly, but she's drawn as this stupid blob gremlin. This isn't a very high-stakes tale, and not everyone is going to relate to every part of Mara's journey, but if you put on your empathy hat for a couple of hours, I do think it's a journey worth going on. Even if your teenage years didn't play out quite like Mara's, a lot of the feelings and themes the story wants to explore are, I think, fairly universal, and there are a bunch of other interesting, varied characters whose stories you'll really get absorbed into. And, well, if your teenage years were anything like Mara's. Uh, well, to steal a peach saliva quote, uh, to some people, this game may be a mirror holding a knife. Uh, some of this might cut a little close to home for some folks out there. Mara isn't a terribly sympathetic main character, as you've probably picked up on by now, and I admit that may rub some people the wrong way. It may really cut into their enjoyment of this game. Personally, again, I find her very entertaining to watch. She's quick to assume the worst of people, takes everything personally, and often seems completely incapable of empathy, of even imagining that someone might need help more than her. She hears what she wants to hear, is usually too busy daydreaming about who a person could be to consider who they actually are. She's convinced that if she has just one good summer, or the opportunity to move to a new school, she'll be able to reinvent herself and turn everything around and suddenly become popular, but Despite her desire for change, she mostly only makes lateral moves as the game goes on, only truly learning and growing toward the back end. And even then, she really only learns and makes significant forward growth if you manage to get the good endings, uh, but I'll, I'll loop back around to that in, in a second. The year-long scope of the game is fun because while she doesn't make a lot of forward progress throughout it, we get to see all the ways in which the people around her change. We watch their stories progress in parallel to hers, and it's impressive how many disparate threads 
come together to make something that feels thematically consistent. There are a lot of people with a lot of different perspectives in this game, and they all seem like people that you knew in high school, or maybe still know now. I've used the words blunt and honest, I think, a couple of times so far in this video, and the lack of any rose-tinted perspective on the time period, on high school, or on how casually vicious and dangerous teenagers can be, it isn't just done to make the game feel realistic or grounded. Everything really feels like it builds to a clear, collective whole. Early on in the story, something pretty awkward and pretty gross happens, but once it happens, you're kind of left to wonder, okay, if that's on the table, how bad could things get from here on out. I think that putting something like that up front, in addition to, you know, telling the player about the game's tone, it also really primes people to engage with every new character Mara meets very closely, really try and suss out their intentions for her. And because you're on such high alert, because you're scrutinizing these people she's engaging with so closely, you're ready to pick up on the subtle hints that the supporting cast all actually have really rich, interesting inner lives. Aside from some extremely minor characters and some deliberately vapid high schoolers, everyone really seems like a fully realized person who existed before Mara came along and will continue to exist long after she leaves their company. They have small little behavioral tics and hidden feelings, wants and needs that Mara is usually too oblivious and self-absorbed to pick up on. A lot of the characters you're never gonna be able to fully understand, no matter what you do in the game, but you're given just enough to make them feel real. These characters will stick with you. You'll keep turning them over in your mind to try and understand them. I think that's a really special quality, and it speaks to how real they seem. Now, all that being said, even though I think it's obvious by now that I really like this game, I do also have some uh, pretty significant criticisms. This is the designer's first game, so some jankiness is to be expected, but Perfect Tides has some pretty fundamental design flaws that I think drag the whole experience down. I would be much more tolerant of the game's issues if they didn't impair the storytelling directly, but they do. And it all kind of stems from the fact that the puzzle design in this game is absolutely batty. This stuff would have been unacceptable even at the height of 90s puzzle game design insanity. The puzzles required for simply progressing through the game usually aren't that bad with a couple of big exceptions, but the problem is that Perfect Tides has extremely complicated, interconnected, game-long puzzles that tie into totally hidden affinity systems. And these hidden puzzles and systems determine the narrative outcome of the game. If you give the wrong snack to the wrong character at the wrong time, sorry, you don't get to fix things with Mara's best friend. If you don't find a floppy disk buried in the sand at the right time, then take it back to your house and snoop through it before returning it to its owner, sorry, you don't get to see maybe the best scene in the game that concludes the story of one of the best characters characters in the game. Some of the best scenes in this game, I'd argue some of the most important scenes, the ones that lend the game a sense of emotional closure and completeness. I would hesitate to call them your run-of-the-mill optional scenes, hidden scenes. These scenes are buried. They are concealed. And I gotta tell you, putting a half a dozen hours in to get a bad ending where Mara doesn't learn anything, doesn't fix any of her relationships, and doesn't grow at all, it's, it's just not terribly satisfying. The game's narrative threatens to feel completely pointless if you come short of the good ending, which would be a problem even if the good ending wasn't meticulously hidden. I mean, I sincerely think that the story feels utterly incomplete without at least getting Simon and Lily's endings. This is the first game that lead developer Meredith Gran has ever made, and she seems aware of a lot of these issues. She posted her own commentated playthrough of the game on YouTube a while back, and even she occasionally forgets puzzle solutions. So I'm hopeful that things will be streamlined, or at least made harder to miss or screw up in a sequel. In fact, I'd almost recommend watching Meredith's playthrough of the game as the best way to experience Perfect Tides. 
For one thing, a lot of the friction that Mara's frustrating personality might create with a member of the audience is diminished when the author is right there laughing at how pathetic she is. And you know, okay, got it, I'm supposed to laugh at her. And of course, there's a lot of information about the development of the game in that playthrough, a lot of info about some of its uh, inspirations. A really fun playthrough, honestly. I very much enjoyed watching the game that way. You also know that you'll get to see the good ending without having to stress about accidentally eating the egg sandwich that you need to pick up in the summer so you can give it to a random character in the fall, so you can get a little bit of extra money to buy a coffee that you need to be able to get the good ending with Jason. Now, for real, the spiderweb of decisions in this game, it may be a little bit much, but hey, in some circles, they just call that replay value. From what I've just said, you may be thinking that the game would be better served as a comic or a novel, but I don't think that's strictly true. There is a lot of meaningful interaction packed into the game, both on a simple entertainment level and on a thematic level. In the first category, there are a ton of conversations in the game that will play out completely differently depending on choices you've made. There's tons of comedy packed into every corner of the game. I mean, this, this is a legitimately really funny video game. And there's tons of little scenarios that can play out totally differently depending on things you do, but on a deeper level, one that actually does do something to enrich the storytelling, I think the choices that you can and can't make do a lot to inform Mara as a character. There's a scene that I really, really love where Mara's mother is watching James Cameron's Titanic late at night and sobbing. She makes a comparison between Jack and her recently deceased husband. This is the most vulnerable we've seen Mara's mom for the entire game so far. And while you do have options about how to approach this scene, Mara is simply incapable of tact. Mara can be pedantic in this moment, or she can be mean, but she can't be nice. The empathy just isn't there. She's too caught up in her own world. She cannot make the choice. I think the interactiveness of the scene reveals something about Mara that a regular linear script might have difficulty with. In that same vein, getting the good ending almost feels like you are constantly wrestling with teenage angst in some way. I think it's interesting that the game part of the game is basically about trying to find ways to slip little acts of kindness and self-care through Mara's self-destructive and hostile tendencies whenever the cracks show. The trouble is, the cracks are buried under a layer of cement and the jackhammer is hidden under a random pixel in the optional forest area. I really think that this story, this script, did deserve the flexibility and room for meandering exploration that a video game can provide, but I also think the writing deserved a game with better conveyance, a game that was slightly more willing to meet the player halfway. There's making your player work for their happy ending, and then there's making them beat their head against hidden LucasArts puzzles for their happy ending. Again, I want to emphasize that I do like this game a lot. I just want to tell people what they'll be in for if they try it for themselves, and also hopefully show why I think this game is interesting and has a lot of promise promise I'd like to see realized in a more refined sequel. But thus is the difficulty of this video now, what with the Kickstarter campaign, considering that I'm currently trying to pitch a game that I know might not be for everyone, and I'm trying to pitch a Kickstarter for the sequel, I know that that's kind of a big time investment and financial ask. If you are interested in Perfect Tides after sitting through this hastily constructed mess of a video, I would sincerely recommend either playing the game with a guide or finding a playthrough of the game that actually has all of the good character ending stuff in it. Again, I recommend the actual one by the developer because, you know, it's pretty interesting. Some fun insight into the game and whatnot. I mean, obviously, I'm not going to tell you not to go buy the game, but if I'm going to direct your money to one place or the other right now, I'm going to direct it towards the Kickstarter because... I, I mean, I want to listen. I want a sequel. I like the. I, I want to get another one. I want to do more stuff with these characters. And currently, you can help me achieve that. So that's where I want you to send your money. Plus, if this one gets funded, see, I've backed it myself. So if it gets made, I'll be in this one. Finally, at long last, I will literally be video games.